Johnson Wales University and the Distinguished Visiting Chef Committee proudly presents the Distinguished Visiting Chef Series, an educational resource and video reference library for culinary students and professionals. Today's guest chef, Scott Liepre. My name is Adam Joseph. I'm the Assistant Director of the Culinary Events Department. Um, again, I'd like to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming out. Instructors, thank you for taking the time out of your classes. Um, here we have a Distinguished Visiting Chef. Uh, this is our 162nd Distinguished Visiting Chef. From here on out, you'll, you'll, be, you'll hear them referred to as the DVC. Um, what, <laughs> what we try to do, is that hilarious, isn't it? Yeah. That's good. I like it. <laughs> Uh, we have a special treat today. Um, it's all in your bio. I'm not going to steal any of the chef's thunder. What I really want to do is kind of touch upon uh, when, we, when we select these uh, DVCs, um, what we try to get across and uh, bring to you as uh, students um, is uh, passion. We try to bring uh, really uh, goals. Um, any chance we get, we'd like to bring a Johnson Wales graduate. Uh, so that we can show you uh, where you're going to be going here pretty soon. Uh, so with that said, you know, like I said, I'm not going to steal too much of Chef's Thunder. Um, I'd like you to all to help me uh, give a warm, warm, super warm welcome to Chef Scott Livefree 93. Thank you. Real quick, I didn't touch 
part of it. But um, it's very, very important. Chef's going to be tasting uh, an oyster today, okay? Uh, any allergies to shellfish and oyster? Oh, oh God. Okay. Um, <laughs> huh? Okay. Can we not spill any juice on these guys, please? <laughs> no, in all seriousness, uh, guys, as, as best you can, um, and I'm going to have my staff at the door. We're going to you know, sanitize and things like that. Everything's been kept clean in the back. So. Um, I want you guys to really just pay attention to not touching anything, okay? Uh, throughout Chef's demo, please ask questions. And uh, if you have a question while he's doing, raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone over. All right, Chef? Are you sure you got everything out now? <laughs> well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, wow, this is uh, pretty exciting. Um, We've been talking about this for probably a good uh, two years at this point right now and just trying to schedule it and trying to put it together. So I have to tell you, this is uh, uh, quite an exciting thing for me to be standing here uh, 20, almost 20 years ago uh, when I was sitting in the same very seats that you were sitting, thinking the same very things that you're probably thinking about. You know, where is it all going and what's going to happen and what do I get to look forward to and uh, everything else that comes along with it. And the only thing that I will say coming back to uh, here and just being here and, and seeing the facility and seeing all the students and just reminiscing about what it meant to me and what it was all about back then. Um, you are receiving a quality education here that will take you very far as long as you keep yourself involved in it and take everything out of it that you can get from it. Uh, there are a lot of trends, there are a lot of things that happen in the industry that change regularly and it changes fast. Uh, the one thing that you will use on a regular basis, no matter what the trends are, no matter what happens in the industry, are the fundamentals that you are being taught here. Uh, I still ask young cooks what the mother sauces are. I still ask them what is the difference between sauteing and braising and why do you do certain things. These are things that will stay with you for your entire career. So make no mistake, you need to learn these things and they will take you very far and it separates you from the person that doesn't know them and would most likely put you in a position that you would want to be in. So trust me when I tell you, learn these things and get comfortable with them because you will use them for your entire career. Okay? <laughs> Morning, wake up. <laughs> Come on. Um, me, my name is Scott Liebfried. I'm from New York originally. I attended Johnson & Wales on a two-year program. That's right, any fellow Long Islanders out there? All right, all right, the girls with the puffy hair. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, about 20 years ago now, uh, I sat in the same very seats you are sitting in and, and thought the same things. And uh, I grew up in a very small town in Long Island. My dad was a cop. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Didn't really have too many options, honestly. I wasn't a very good student. Uh, didn't really care much for school, uh, per se. Tried college a couple of times. Didn't work out every time I tried it. Um, and therefore, uh, for some reason, I started working in restaurants. Uh, I was young. I liked uh, the environment. I liked the people. Uh, I felt very comfortable. And I felt like I found a place where I belong, uh, honestly. And from there, uh, I worked in restaurants from the time I was 19 till about, well, till last week, <laughs> and still am. Um, but I, I worked with some people that came through the program here at one point, uh, my sous chef at the time. Uh, was a graduate from Johnson & Wales and we got into talking. I was very young and uh, we had a great conversation and he recommended that I look into uh, this uh, cooking school that was up in Rhode Island that was fairly small and, and kind of new at the time and uh, so I did. And um, I walked down the halls and I saw what was going on and, and at that point I think that there was just this, this exciting spark inside of me and this thought in my mind that this is really exciting and this is something that I really think that I would be good at uh, and something that I think I would want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, and being in the positions that you're in, you guys get a lot of pressure of, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Uh, the fortunate thing for most of you is that the industry has changed so much that there are so many other opportunities now in the food business that you do not have to graduate from here and work in a restaurant and a hotel for the rest of your life. That's the good thing. Uh, there's a lot of different avenues that enable you now to have a future, to have a family, uh, to have a life outside of it. Because believe me, I spent my 10 and uh, almost 12 years of no Christmases, no holidays, no vacations, no nothing. Uh, because that's what I chose to do and that's where I wanted to be in this business. I wanted to learn how to cook. I wanted to be a great cook. Uh, and I didn't want to be an administrator. I didn't, for 10 solid years, I wanted to be a great cook. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what I did. 
and it led me to great people, amazing places, uh, things that I thought I would never experience in my life as a kid from a small town in New York. And it's been fantastic, I'll tell you. I have lifelong friends right now, uh, people that I went to school with here 20 years ago that I'm still friends with uh, that have been to weddings and kids' birthday parties, uh, you know, family events. I know their parents. Uh, I've unfortunately been to their grandparents' passings, but these are the people that I've met while I was here and the people that are still close friends of mine in, in my life right now and on a daily basis. So understand you have such a golden opportunity here for not only career as well as friends, future, uh, and potentially family. So please take advantage of all this stuff because you are on the stepping stone of something that is going to involve the rest of your life. And it's exciting. You just got to find the excitement, right? Smile, please. <laughs> there we go. It's a lot easier to smile than it is to not. It takes more uh, facial muscles uh, to avoid smiling than it does. Trust me. <laughs> so uh, that's just a little bit about me. Currently, uh, I have been very fortunate to do a lot of great things in my life that involved the food business and also had met uh, some amazing people. Uh, and, and it just continues to happen on a daily basis. Um, I was able to work for great companies, uh, eventually uh, start my own company, which I have right now. I've opened my first, my own first restaurant. Uh, almost on September 11th of this year, so it's almost four months right now. Uh, and believe me, the only thing that's on my mind right now currently is what's going on right there. So as long as you understand that and have that sort of drive inside of you and that passion and that attachment to something, then you are where you belong at this point. <laughs> if you don't, there are other places for you to go. And uh, I've been speaking a lot about this research and development program that you have here, and it sounds pretty fascinating to me. Uh, and had that been available, uh, you know, many, many years ago when I was here, that was something that I probably would have looked into. Uh, there's great things going on with great companies that finally understand things and want to know things from a chef's point of view. We finally have a say in what's going on. Uh, and it's exciting, too. Uh, you know, we get, uh, I do a lot of work with uh, some of the companies out in uh, California where I live, uh, and they're really interested to know what's going on from our point of view now. Uh, although it relates to marketing and demographics and ingredients and lifestyle, um, they feel that there is a huge opportunity that's been missed for a long time from a chef's point of view. So good luck with that program, anybody that's involved in it, because it sounds very exciting and it sounds like it goes uh, a lot further than some of the other programs might for some people. Um, so currently, I, uh, I have a few partners. We uh, have a, a really nice little company that we started. Uh, we have a really nice culture, and we have some great people that work with us. And we're just really, at this point, taking a stab at what we've always wanted to do and finally having the opportunity to do it. Uh, so do not get discouraged. It may happen when you're 25. It may happen when you're 30. It may happen when you're 35. It may happen when you're 40. Uh, but the point is, is that please always keep the faith and keep the passion in the business you are, business you are involved in. Because once you all leave here and move on to wherever it is that you go in this business, it is partially your responsibility to make sure that the future generations that are coming up behind you have the knowledge, understanding, and the experience that it takes to maintain the standards that we've put in place for ourselves. It's all of our responsibility to protect the industry. Because there's a lot of people out there trying to do what they do uh, in a fashion that doesn't necessarily agree with somebody that has high standards. Okay? Uh, I have been lucky enough and very fortunate to uh, work in food-related television. Uh, what I can tell you from that experience as it continues is that the hard work that I have put in as a young cook and a real chef and somebody that believed in what I was doing enabled me to do those things. It was not because I ended up somewhere someday uh, and met the right people and wanted to audition for a TV show. It didn't happen that way. It's not like that at all. Uh, I uh, strongly feel any opportunity that I've had in this area uh, only came to me because I had the drive, the knowledge, and the experience that I acquired in the business to be a professional cook and a good chef. So any of you that are thinking about that direction, trust me, you have some time ahead of you to acquire the skills and knowledge to get there. Uh, it is hard work. Do you think working in a hotel or restaurant is hard? Television is even worse. <laughs> there are no limits, and the days are long, and the nights are even longer, and the hours are, uh, it, it's tough. It's a grueling, grueling schedule. Uh, so trust me when I tell you, it is, it is not as glamorous as most people think it is, uh, because it's demanding, just like anything else. Oh, thank you for coming, gentlemen. <laughs> Glad you were on time. <laughs> Have a seat right here in the front, please.
Mark. As I, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, uh, I do, uh, from when I graduated here at Johnson Wells, I do have some close friends that live close by. Uh, and these guys came down to see me uh, and spend some time with me because I don't get to see them very often because they live far away. Uh, so we were out last night having a little dinner late at night. And um, <laughs> they decided to sleep in a little bit today. So um, that's my background. That's currently where I stand right now. Um, and I continue to grow and I continue to develop because it, and it, at the end of the day in this business, if you stop learning, it's over. You might as well go do something else or retire because we are in a business that you learn something new every single day, and you should. And Chef Stanley and I had this conversation, and when he tells me that there are still things that he learns on a daily basis, to me, that's exciting to know that there's always going to be something different. Okay? Does anybody have any questions before we get into the fun part of cooking some food, some very simple food? Uh, if you think that I am going to show you the next big fascinating thing that's going to happen in the industry, I hate to disappoint you. It's not what you're going to see here today. Uh, but what you will see are some things that I believe are the fundamentals and some of the things that are uh, a core uh, techniques and core knowledge uh, that will take you very far that you will use for the entire length of your career. Okay, Very simple stuff. These are all dishes that we do in my restaurant that's uh, up in Santa Barbara in California. Uh, we have a great little seafood spot and uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. And uh, when I tell you, uh, you will learn these things as you go along. Uh, I didn't do this restaurant. I didn't open it to have the white tablecloths and the big fancy ambiance and anything like that. We opened it so it would be rough and tough and fun. So people would be having a good time to serve people quality food, because at the end of the day, that's always important, uh, in an atmosphere that's very, very comfortable, which I think we've done, uh, and also with a perception of value attached to everything that is on the menu. We live in a different time right now, and people are not spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on meals. Uh, they are in some places, but as far as I'm concerned, I am now a businessman as well as a chef, and I want to make sure that the seats in my restaurant are full, because if they are, that means we are paying the bills and we are doing something right. Uh, I don't want to wait for the one special occasion. Uh, I don't want to wait for the once a year person that comes out to dinner. I want the people that come out three times a week. Uh, I want to offer them value at a happy hour. I want to offer them a moderately priced menu. Uh, and I want the seats to be full because if they are, we're doing something right. Uh, so understand it's not always about tablecloths and, and, and fine china. And, and there's a lot of other things that make it a little bit more interesting than going down that road. Trust me when I tell you that. All right, anybody got any questions before we get started? Anything? Yes? The name of the restaurant is Arch Rock Fish, and we're going to uh, do a little, uh, you guys are going to help me with something at the end, so somebody remind me about that, because uh, uh, we do some really great ad campaigns, and part of what we've done is uh, create our own commercials, uh, so I'm going to have you guys help me out with one of them, uh, and I'll explain that at the end, uh, but you're all going to be a part of it. Anybody else? Questions? Come on. What do you got? Come on. There's no questions whatsoever. Yes? Yes, I lived there for quite a few years. Uh, I lived out on Martha's Vineyard after I graduated from uh, Johnson & Wales. I stuck around for a little while. Uh, uh, I didn't have any direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, a friend had mentioned it to me, told me it was a pretty cool place, uh, a lot of great restaurants. Uh, it's on the beach. Uh, a lot of people have a good time there. You can work. All summer long, you can make a pocket full of money and you can get out, get out of there in October and go do whatever you wanted to do. And that sounded exciting to me. Uh, I lived in Agartown. I worked uh, in, a, Thai, I worked in a, a restaurant called David Ryan's, which was a uh, very, very busy uh, bar and restaurant. Uh, again, great food. It wasn't white tablecloths. It wasn't fine service. Uh, but I did have the ability to walk down to the harbor on a regular basis and get to know some of the fishermen, and, and they would come in with a you know, a random 200 pound halibut and you know, we'd go down to the boat and throw it over the back and drag it up the street and scream to everybody how uh, the fish at David Ryan's was uh, the halibut special tonight would knock your socks off. Uh, and it was fun. And those are the things that I enjoyed doing. Uh, I, I also worked uh, in a, um, an Italian restaurant called Latanzi's. Albert Latanzi is still a very good friend of mine. Um, he opened my eyes to some things that were pretty unique. Um, and again, I didn't ever want it to be a big company guy and a big corporate guy. And uh, Albert was a very passionate cook. Uh, he was uh, a very passionate Italian cook. And you know, he taught me how to make breads and pasta and, and just you know, a, a different point of view of food from a different culture that was very, very exciting to me uh, and showed such a great interest. He was one of these guys that uh, you know, he had a great little business. He you know, never made 
uh, a fortune in his life and still doesn't, but he made enough to be very comfortable. Uh, every year uh, we would close down in November uh, and he would go to Italy and, and I was fortunate the first year that uh, I worked for him that he took me uh, and experience, had the experience and exposed me to the things that he was so passionate about that eventually became very important to me. Uh, you know, I was very young. Um, I had no idea what was really going on around me, but I knew I was sitting in Tuscany eating pasta and hanging out with a guy that spoke fluent Italian and just going, this, this is a part of my life that I need to get to. Uh, and something that I need to do, and uh, and I did, and uh, and I frequent uh, my wife, my now wife, uh, then girlfriend of 12 years or something like that. Trust me, we were all dysfunctional in this business. <laughs> I can't even remember how long we dated, but I think it was around 12 years before we got married. Uh, at least that's what some of my friends tell me. Um, uh, and it's a big part of my life now. We uh, I travel to it, from that experience, and and part of what we do, and part of what we live and breathe in this business, as far as the, the passion that boils inside of us, is that you remember that experience not only from the place, not only from the people, not only from the ambiance, the atmosphere, but I always remember it from what I ate, and how good it was, and and the pizza, and the pasta, and the breads, and the wine, and the you know the the the. You got to be careful too, because the wild boar run free on the property, and if you run into one of those in the middle of the night, you got. You hopefully you have your jogging shoes on, uh, but it's the it's that's what I remember from all the experiences in my life. Everything that I've done is I've always found the way to make it food related to me, uh, and that's where I always have the experience and the memories, and that's why I do the things that I do because it's 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 once you start pull, peeling the layers back on on uh, culture and food and how they relate. Um, if you truly are somebody that wants to learn how to be a great cook and somebody that wants to really do well in this business, you will um, understand that passion and understand that, that cultural part and how it affects food in our lives, and you will pursue these things. It's, it's fascinating and never ending. There was a question over here a few minutes ago. Yes? I just want to know like, your experience in Elk's Kitchen. What about it? That's yeah, pretty intense. <laughs> I, what I will tell you is that uh, I was very fortunate to meet some of the people uh, through a complete accident, through actually the fact of being a, a professional chef is how it all came about. Uh, I worked for a very uh, small but boutique restaurant company for a while. Our uh, public relations people called me up one day and said that they uh, heard about an opportunity uh, in a food related television program. Uh, and this was much bigger and greater than things like Food Network and stuff like that where it was coming to prime time. Uh, they asked me if I had any interest in meeting some of the people involved because they felt that I had uh, certain qualities that they were looking for, I think, <laughs> as part of it. Uh, and uh, I did not because, again, I was in, engrossed in my career. I had my first executive chef job. Like I was really excited and that's the only thing I wanted to do. So I, I didn't show much interest in it at all. Uh, and actually, Dean and I were talking about this the other night. I showed no interest in it whatsoever. Uh, I had no idea who the people were. I had no idea who Gordon was, what he looked like, what it was all about, and I didn't care either. Uh, but I did go in front of the, uh, the meetings and the interviews, and uh, after I left every single one of them, because there were quite a few of them, I, uh, you know, I just said, I, you know, as soon as you walk out the door, you, your mind starts reeling back. I got two parties tonight, you know, my sous chef is off tonight, I got to do this, I got to do this. And you just go back to work and go about your business, because that's who I was and that's what I was doing. And that's what excited me. Uh, I was asked to come in for a, uh, another meeting, and, um, and I did. And there were four people sitting around the table, uh, and there was one person sitting at the end of the table that wasn't saying much of anything. Uh, and I didn't know who he was. I had no idea. Uh, so we just started conversing and conversing. And, and at that moment, a um, gentleman sitting at the end of the table uh, stopped the entire conversation and asked me, how was your brigade? And I was like, OK, this guy's not a TV guy. This guy knows a little something different. Uh, and then from that point, we struck a conversation and uh, just really started talking about the business, just started talking about you know, the industry, being a chef, and how it relates to a lot of different things. Turns out that was Gordon Ramsay. That was the first time I met him. I didn't know. Uh, from there, um, they offered me the opportunity. I turned it down three times before I accepted it. Uh, and then from there, it's, it's morphed into something that has been a major part of my life for the last almost six years now. So uh, again, what I'll circle back to is something I said in the beginning. The opportunities that I got for that were completely based on the fact of how I felt about being a professional chef and how important it was to me. So please don't think that you're going to leave here and be the next big 
TV star uh, uh, in the food world because chances are it's probably not going to happen. But take that passion and that drive and that understanding and how it relates to food and, and really learn it and, and make it be a part of everything that you do every day. And you will get to where you want to go. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. Is there any other questions? Yes. Ooh, it's a lot to learn. Um, great question about opening your own business because it's something that you don't really think a lot about um, until the time is right. Um, for me, I, you know, I wanted to do it for a very long time but never felt that I was really ready. Uh, and then when the opportunity started coming up, and you got to look at every single one of them individually and, and you got to just sit down and honestly weigh out the pros, weigh out the cons, and you got to figure out how much it's going to cost you too because this is an expensive business and things happen. And you don't find out about a lot of things until it's almost too late. And you could lose a lot of money very quickly. Um, so I, to answer the question, I mean, it, I think it's inside the individual as to when they think they're ready. Uh, and if you can honestly sit down and, and decide that, you know, this is the opportunity and this is the experience and the knowledge that I have and this is where I think I can go with it, um, you'll know if it's right. But you will make mistakes too along the way, trust me. The only difference is you have to make the mistakes to try to minimize the cost of the mistakes. <laughs> that's the only thing, that's really the only advice I can give. You get, everything else you'll, you'll end up doing because you need to or want to, uh, but please just try to minimize the financial risk because it can get out of control very quickly. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Anybody else? No questions? Nobody? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just say I'm over here. Yes. Did you ever work in a place or have an experience in which you didn't Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the great question on the floor right now is that did you ever have an experience that, uh, that it didn't work for you? Or, or uh, everybody has them. Trust me. And if I think you ask even, you know, from the faculty to the administrators to every professional chef in the world, uh, we all have one or two experiences that we speak, we never speak of. Um, and I had mine, you know, I, again, I was goofing around uh, in the winter. I moved out to Hawaii with a bunch of friends. Um, and at that point, I didn't know much about, uh, you know, the, the corporate structure, the corporate restaurant world. Um, I had an opportunity. I started working in a, uh, a restaurant that was a part of a bigger company. And I will tell all of you the embarrassment factor for me was uh, I had learned that the company that I was working for was also the same company. Uh, that branded and opened all the bubblegum shrimp companies. So to me, I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> like, I want to be a real cook. And, I, and now they got this guy that sits outside the restaurant on a park bench and does this whole bubblegum thing. I guess you guys don't know much about it or have you seen one of these things? Uh, you know, so again, for me to be a part of an organization like that was a little embarrassing because I didn't know going into it because it's something I never wanted to do. Uh, so that was one of them. Uh, there were one or two other things. I pursued some opportunities when I first moved out to California. As uh, uh, back then, everybody was talking about, you know, private chef jobs are great. You know, they pay great. You get benefits. You get to do all these great things. And uh, you know, for me, at the end of the day, I was like, I just don't see the point. You got to pick up somebody's food, and then you got to pick up their toilet paper and all this other crap. And I don't really understand how that works. Um, but I tried it, and uh, it lasted a day. <laughs> that was it. And there were great opportunities, you know, there was, there was one uh, I was asked to, uh, I was offered a position at that time, uh, now deceased, but Aaron Spelling's house, and, and they're just, you know, all these great celebrities and all these people that are uh, in the movies and in the industry. Is that girl sleeping? <laughs> Wake up. No, not you. Oh, it didn't look like it, I'm sorry. Uh, so, yeah, we all have the experiences. I tried it. It wasn't for me because, uh, again, for me, I wanted to be enthralled in the industry. I was, uh, you know, there were great things going on and there was always some exciting things with some of the big hotel companies, some of the boutique restaurant companies. Uh, Catering is always a great avenue because it's much bigger and greater now than it ever has been. Uh, but we all have, the, we all make mistakes and we've all done things uh, that we uh, regret uh, at some point. But again, it's, it's just like opening your own business. It's part of the learning uh, process and if you don't do it and you don't fail to a point where you have to brush yourself off and move on to the next thing and forget about it then you'll, there's always be that lesson that you didn't learn. We all have them. Uh, yes? So how did you decide like, what your restaurant was going to be about? It's, it's all about seafood, right? 
Yes? Um, it took a long time to think about it, uh, and it took a lot of uh, personal time as to the question on the floor is that how did I decide what it was that um, uh, uh, the restaurant was going to be and, and what we were going to brand it as. Uh, and it, it took a long time. And for me, again, I, I think back on my entire career and where it went and where it took me and where I am right now. And what was always important to me were the best times of my life. Uh, and that's when I was in the position of most of you, where I was pretty fresh out of culinary school. I had not much responsibility. I didn't own anything. Uh, except a beat up car and a duffel bag full of uh, clothing uh, that was probably stolen or borrowed from certain people along the way. Uh, I'm telling you, I had nothing. And unless you find yourself in that position at some point in your life, it's really hard to progress forward. Uh, I was living in an apartment that I could have moved out of and within five or eight minutes, tops. All my stuff could be gone. Um, again, I take it back to I wanted to learn how to cook. and I, That's what was important to me. And um, I packed up all my stuff in my car and moved out to the vineyard and I, and I just had this amazing experience with people and seafood and you know, being busy and learning the business and being in restaurants and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the people that come along with it was a big part of it. Uh, and then from that point, there was always a, there's always going to be a progression in your career. And what I always recommend is that you take the opportunities, even if you may not want them, there's always going to be a learning opportunity. I worked for the Four Seasons as a sous chef, and they offered me an opportunity to run the banquet department for, uh, I did it for a little over a year. Uh, never wanted to do it, was never interested in being a banquet chef, but the opportunity to run functions and, and just be responsible for a department that did $12 million a year uh, as the person in charge was exciting to me because I knew eventually that would come into play in my own life and whatever I end up doing next. Um, so again, I, when we started branding the restaurant, because it is branding, we're not just uh, good cooks. We have to think about other things along the way because there is branding, there is marketing, there is advertising. There's a lot of other things that we need to encompass our <laughs> careers into. But I just, honestly, I went back to the, the, to the best times of my life as a, as a cook uh, and as somebody that really enjoyed restaurants, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And that's why it's casual, because I worked at a lot of very casual restaurants that were very busy, that served very good food. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. We, a couple of us were out to dinner the other night. And uh, without saying it, uh, in front of each other, we're all looking at the menu. We're looking down the menu, looking down the menu. And uh, after we all ordered, we all looked at each other and said, damn, that hamburger just sounded really good, didn't it? Uh, and the point is, is that it was the first item on the menu. And it sounded great. And I'm sure it was great. So uh, always understand that as a good cook and as a passionate cook, the same thing that goes into a hamburger, a pizza, is the same thing that should go in the foie gras, that should go in the torchon, and should go into any other luxury item that's out there. If you can take that approach and apply it to everything that you do, you will be a successful cook and you will be a great cook. All right, excellent questions, guys. Uh, let's let Chef start his demo and entertain more questions um, after, maybe uh, even some midway through. Sure. Uh, so uh, let's get rocking and rolling, Chef. Yeah. I almost forgot I had to do that. <laughs> I thought we were just going to sit there and hang out for a little while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, we'll get this turned up a little bit. We'll get this one turned on a little bit. I'm going to have one of these real quick. OK. Um, mussels. You see them everywhere. Um, great item very different from place to place. Uh, when we started talking about this dish and how I wanted to do it and why I wanted to do it, uh, we have a fantastic supplier out in uh, California. Um, and they harvest these mussels that are amazing. These are uh, great. The ones that we get from the farm that we deal with, they're probably three times the size of these. They're huge. But what makes them different is that the, uh, the meat inside, the actual mussel itself, is almost as big as the shell. These things are amazing. And they're sweet, and they're tender, and they just have an amazing flavor. Uh, no matter where you go, there are going to be resources in the immediate area where you are. Find these people. Don't just pick up the phone and call a Cisco salesman. That's the easy way out. You know, Find these people. Find somebody that's doing something a little bit different. Try to work them into your uh, strategy, into your menu, into anything that you're doing. Um, people recognize that from a marketing point of view because you do try to source out people that are in your immediate area and support local businesses. Uh, at that point, they are supporting you because you understand the same philosophy they do. Uh, and these people work hard. They're passionate people and they're passionate about what they do. Uh, so try to support them in any way that you can. 
Um, muscle dish, you see it all over the place. Uh, I've always found a fascination with uh, muscles being done in very different ways, but then, you know, we test people sometimes, and you go into a place, and you don't even open the menu and just say, yeah, I'll have the mussels, knowing that they're steamed in white wine with, you know, a little bit of cream and garlic and shallots and probably some parsley or something like that. Um, I personally, when it comes to th things like this and dishes like this, I think about the ingredient itself. I think about the mussel. It's seafood. It's a clam. Uh, it's got a little bit of that, that briny seafood flavor to it. It's got a little bit of that salty flavor to it. Um, it's kind of meaty but really soft in texture at the same time. What would I want to do with that in order to make it uh, better? How to enhance it? Not to change it, um, not to make it unfamiliar in any sort of way at all, but how can I enhance it and just make it a little bit better than what somebody else would do? Um, I love garlic. I'm a huge fan of shallots and onions. I love grilled bread. Lobster stock fascinates me. Um, I have a mixture of uh, creme fraiche uh, with Dijon mustard, as well as grain mustard, two different textures of mustard. One is very spicy, the other one is uh, not as spicy, a little bit sweet, but then you got a nice little pop from the seeds in there. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are all items that I felt I wanted to incorporate with my muscle dish. Um, white wine, everybody does white wine. So, you know, beer is always around, it's readily available. Um, in some places, in most places. Um, but again, the, taking this dish from what we do at the restaurant, um, the mussels come from that small little supplier down there in the, in the harbor, and that's what they do. Uh, we have a great uh, artisan beer, uh, beer supplier in the immediate area. It's right down the street from us, uh, Telegraph Brewery. They make excellent beer, and it's not this massive operation. It's five guys making beer, literally, in a garage somewhere. Uh, it's a really nice garage, but that's what they do. Uh, and they've uh, gotten themselves to the point where they're available in Whole Foods markets, in Gelson's. And to walk down the store, uh, the aisles of these grocery stores, and see these guys' products sitting on the wall, knowing that I know them and I know their operation, is fascinating to me. It is five guys in a warehouse making beer. That's it. They brew it. They bottle it. They put the labels on by hand. They do everything themselves. And it shows in the, in the quality of the product. So always try to find these, these smaller uh, suppliers in your area and just try to do something a little bit different. It's really what it comes down to. What makes you different than the next person? <coughs> a lot of people are doing the same thing. All right. So we are going to sweat down uh, a little bit of garlic and shallot. Um, we are going to deglaze with some beer. I'm using all the fancy cooking terms too in case you don't know. I don't, I don't get to do this very often so it's pretty exciting to me. So we're going we're gonna to sweat down the garlic and the shallots. We're going to deglaze with the beer. Um, we are going to steam the mussels partially. Uh, we're going to add some lobster stock, and we're going to finish with <coughs> excuse me, the creme fraiche mixture. Um, anything that's got this liquid form to it in the bottom, or you know, it's just you either want to have a, uh, a spoon to finish it. You can very easily drink it as well, too. Uh, or you can just have some crusty bread to put with it. So we're just going to grill some bread, rub it with some garlic, and really that's, that's the entire thing. It is that simple. Um, we will have uh, some chives to go with it as well as some parsley. Uh, again, cooking and finishing food is about building layers. Uh, layers of flavor starting from the bottom, it's a foundation, all the way up to the top, which is the roof. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to incorporate everything into the pan and serve it. You can finish with garnishes on the outside that are torn herbs. Um, I personally, uh, especially with seafood being the foundation of what we do, olive oil is amazing. I live in uh, California and we just have an amazing variety, uh, uh, variety of olive oils from Spanish style to Italian style to French style, uh, as well as the imported ones. Great, great finish for seafood as well as steaks. Um, a piece of fish comes off the grill, it comes out of the pan, immediately give it uh, a finish of either an extra virgin olive oil or uh, an olive oil that's been mixed with some fresh squeezed lemon juice or lemon zest. The pores of the product or the protein are wide open at that point. So anything that you put on there will absorb into the protein itself, which in turn will give you an additional layer of flavor that you wouldn't expect to be there. So understanding food and knowing how to be a great cook is a lot more than having a proper sear or a proper grill. Understand the food that you're working with. Once you get that part down, then the rest of it's easy. So as per normal fashion, we have a little bit of olive oil. And you can see that's not smoking hot. <coughs> um, 
I like to insert in dishes like this. Um, you'll notice that the shallots are sliced as well as the garlic. Um, this does not require the immediate saute that most of the things would do or need if they were finely minced. Um, it's a little bit different texture. Um, you get a little bit different flavor off of the, the items that are going in there. Uh, and just, again, we like to start with something that's not smoking hot, bring it up a little bit slower in order to enhance the flavor and to uh, have the flavor into the olive oil, which again is building the layers of flavor. So you have your garlic, your shallots, and then building up from there. We're gonna make sure that the, uh, oh, probably not advised. Okay, uh, mise en place, we make sure that all of our ingredients and all of our items are ready. Uh, I have my pan, I have all of my uh, ingredients cut, ready to go, I have my mussels cleaned, I have my spoons, I have all, everything that I need right here. So we start off with just a little bit of the garlic. And notice how the pan's not smoking, smoking hot right now, because I don't want it that way. I want everything to lightly saute. Not much color, more flavor. I have it off the heat right now. Normally, if this was as hot as it could be or should be, this would have burned up right now. Right now, they're just slowly sauteing, slowly releasing flavor, which in turn you will taste throughout the entire dish, rather than just doing a quick saute. <coughs> and again, I'm a texture guy too. I like things in a different form. I love rustic food. I think rustic food really comes from a different place inside of you and portrays more of an image of somebody. And I've always felt that way. I think people speak volumes uh, about themselves in the ways that they cook the food that they cook. Okay, so now we're just gonna try to bring the temperature up a little bit. Add our mussels. Trying to avoid, there's a little bit of water in the bottom there. We don't wanna get that in there. Okay, very important when cooking uh, any kind of shellfish that you are steaming. Uh, always try to cover the pan. <coughs> Excuse me, add your liquid. Um, bring it up to a, a really rapid boil with a lid on. The end result is that it, it helps the, uh, the mussels, the clams, whatever's in there, helps them open up a lot wider. So you're not sitting there trying to peel every single one of them open at the end. Okay, we got this really hot. I'm gonna add some of the beer. Always make sure you taste your beer first to make sure that it's good enough. Okay, a little salt and pepper, because again, you wanna build layers as you go. Uh, you don't want to season all at once in the beginning or all at once at the end. Uh, there might be some missed opportunities there uh, to enhance the flavor along the way rather than try to make up for it at the end. Uh, again, being a good cook is about knowing the steps all the way through. It's not about uh, being able to put this pan on the stove and follow this recipe repeatedly. It's, um, it's looking at certain items. Uh, you know, I made a, 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 we had a discussion yesterday about the pasta dough and, and no matter where you are and how many times you make the pasta dough according to the recipe exactly, it's always gonna be different. <laughs> the eggs are gonna be different sizes. The moisture could be different where you are. The humidity could be different where you are. There's so many variables that you have to know what you're looking for in the end result. All of your senses are working together. Your hands are alarming your brain that something's wrong because it doesn't feel right. The smell is, you know, you, you get the aromas and you like something doesn't smell right and you're looking for something. You know, the person that can find something that's burning in the kitchen before anybody else even knew what happened, those are your senses going off. You smell something and automatically, without even thinking about it, something's burning. And now everybody knows it, but you knew it first. All of your senses are working together. We were playing with the pasta dough yesterday and you feel, feel how it's dry, you feel how it's wet, you feel, feel how you have to adjust it. Even though we followed the recipe exactly, it's freezing cold outside, first of all, and I've been complaining about that since I got here. So if anybody's got any control over the, the temperature dial outside, do me a favor and turn it up a little bit. <laughs> uh, but that has uh, a little bit to do with the outcome of everything that we're doing. Uh, again, the egg yolks, uh, same thing when you're doing pasta. Every, if an egg came out of a chicken consistently every single time, we would have no problem. It doesn't always happen. So understanding the recipes and knowing what you're doing along the way and being comfortable with the food and being comfortable in your own self and your own knowledge to say this isn't right, but we can make it right very easily. Okay, mussels are steaming open. Look at that. Now you notice how they're pretty wide open at this point right now. This is what we're looking for. Um, without the lid, yeah, they, it would be fine. It, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, but again, knowing that it could be better just by taking that additional step separates somebody that wants to be a good cook from a great cook. And practice it at home. I mean, how many, those of you that have any industry experience, you know that it's hard to find one of these in any professional kitchen anywhere. 
Usually when we get our small wares order, everybody takes the pans out, they're like, wow, look at these things. They put these in a milk crate and it goes in a storage unit somewhere and you never see them. Uh, use these things, <coughs> excuse me. Use them to your advantage. It's for a reason. Okay, to this, uh, just a little bit of lobster stock. Um, lobster stock not readily available, feel free to interchange if you have any kind of fish stock or something. Uh, also goes very well. Uh, again, building that layer. So now we got the garlic, the shallots, we have the beer in there which is reduced and now it's a little bit more fortified than it was when we first put it in there. We added the lobster stock. Uh, again, adding a little bit more of a shellfish flavor, a little bit of a sweeter flavor. Um, the stock is made properly. Uh, these are the components that you get out of it. Any aromatics that may have put in it will come through uh, at this point. Okay. Uh, again, mise en place, we have uh, recipied out the creme fraiche, the Dijon mustard, and the grain mustard mixed together with a little bit of white balsamic vinegar. Um, red wine vinegar, very popular. Champagne vinegar, very popular. Personally, I like the white balsamic. I think it's really sweet. Uh, I think it has a little bit of the Italian flair, which I really enjoy, which in my opinion, accentuates seafood to a certain degree. Uh, if you've ever been to a coastal community of any of these places, it's very simple food. Uh, fresh lemon juice, good olive oil, good vinegar, fresh seafood. That's it, that's all it is. And it's delicious every single time. Okay, so we're just gonna add a little bit of the creme fraiche. And mix it in, and it smells amazing already. I mean, if you guys can, I don't know how fast that's traveling, but uh, again, Dijon mustard, grain mustard, uh, grain enhancements for things like mussels, in my opinion, in very small doses. Uh, there is something to be said about a lot of classical preparation of certain dishes. Uh, again, creme fraiche, Dijon. Uh, we toyed a little bit about putting uh, uh, some really fine frites on top of this, but then felt it lost a little bit of its identity along the way. So we didn't necessarily want to do that. But the end result is a dish that we're very happy with. Uh, we finished and seasoned a little bit more. <laughs> See, not all ham went right to the beer. I guess nobody noticed that, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> okay, uh, we're bringing up the temperature. Very important, most importantly, what I find uh, highly unusual, because uh, I spend a lot of time in the industry too, still, uh, get familiar with the way things are supposed to taste. The only way you'll know if they're right is if you're tasting them every single time. Please, please, <clears throat> don't stick your finger in there. Don't get into this habit. It's just one of those things. Uh, it takes an extra step to make sure that you have all of your sp spoons and all of your utensils close by. Take the extra step. The only way you're going to know is if you taste it. So I almost did it again. Okay. Uh, Reseason with salt and pepper. Uh, I am going to add a little bit of chives. At this point, just again, right at the last minute, knowing your ingredient. We don't want to add them too much uh, in the beginning because we don't want them to cook through. Uh, a nice showering of fresh chives really changes the flavor and enhances the entire dish and it makes it look pretty awesome. Okay, in the meantime, we're going to take a little bit of ciabatta and we're going to have some grilled crusty bread to go with it. I asked him to install a charcoal grill in here before I got here, but apparently it wasn't in the budget. Never know unless you ask him. Okay. And then, very simply, while the bread is grilling, I have this beautiful plate here. Actually, I'm going to go over right here. just to avoid a little bit of a stick. Uh, and it's just one of, you can bake these ahead of time. You don't necessarily have to grill them. Uh, there's just something about a charred piece of, piece of bread that goes with uh, certain dishes and something that you could dip into. Uh, that's just pretty exciting to me. Okay, so very simply, our mussels. Okay, slotted spoon will work just as well. You can arrange them any way you like, pile them as high as you like. Uh, again, at this point, it's up to the individual and however you feel about wanting to present the food that you want to present. Okay, we pour the juice right over the top and don't be afraid to have a little bit of extra in there because everybody always wants a little bit of extra when it comes to something like this. Okay, we'll turn the bread over, just get a little more color on it. And again, we want to build layers of flavor. So at this point, what I feel and what I really like to do with a lot of food, just about everything that I cook. At this point, some fresh parsley, which is always nice. And a nice finish of extra virgin olive oil. 
And I haven't really done much of anything unique and mind-blowing in my opinion, but I've taken the time to grill the bread, take a little bit of garlic, rub it right on top, just to get that flavor in there without being too much, okay? And you have your ale steam mussels, gray mustard, Dijon mustard, and creme fraiche, uh, finished with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil and grilled ciabatta bread. It's that simple. Okay. Um, leading back to what I was talking about, my, my good friend Albert Latanzi out there on the vineyard, uh, again, very passionate cook, very uh, passionate Italian, uh, and, and taught me a lot of great things, not only about uh, being a, a businessman, but being true and honest to what you're doing, uh, and, and follow it through. Don't start anything that you can't finish. Don't, uh, if you want to make fresh bread every day, make it properly. Make sure you have your starter. Make sure you have the temperature proper in the room. Make sure you're taking all the additional steps to be a professional at doing what you're doing. Uh, pasta dough for me, uh, again, this is a gentleman that, that taught me how to do this uh, and it stayed with me for my entire career. Uh, and he felt very strong about it, so therefore uh, I in turn feel really strong about it. Uh, pasta is part of uh, your curriculum. I'm sure you guys are learning how to make it on a regular basis. Uh, in the industry, we uh, are always pressed for time uh, and time is always something that we never have enough of. Uh, so we have to figure out ways how to uh, take recipes that we have and ingredients that we want to prepare, and we have to figure out how to make them adaptable to the industry so we're not wasting time. Um, we and I have always done all my pasta doughs in the food processor. Uh, it's a little bit faster, it's a little bit finer, um, and these are, it saves a lot of time, a lot of time. Flour's already scaled out uh, to the flour. I have uh, salt in there already. Okay, so far, real easy. I put it in the food processor, I turn it on. Uh, right now it's running. Uh, it's not necessarily grinding the flour, it's incorporating the salt that was in there. Uh, to that, I add a little bit of olive oil, extra virgin, uh, just for flavor. Uh, the one thing that I like to do that's pretty different, uh, pasta dough, when it's done, usually has this pale um, color that's just not very appealing and not very attractive. Uh, it doesn't really enhance the food that it's with. It doesn't really look any better. Um, you can put smoked paprika in it. You can put any kind of uh, uh, pepper. You can put what you want in there to try to color it. Um, but I like the nice color of pasta uh, as it comes out. A little saffron mixed with water. That simple. You can do it you know, a couple of days at a time. You can do it a quart at a time. Uh, just steep a little saffron in some hot water and into the dough it goes. A tablespoon. Uh, it'll make the biggest difference at the end and it just again it makes the food look a lot more appealing a lot more exciting and much more vibrant um, eggs i have yolks and whites mixed together um, whole eggs uh, and egg yolks uh, ratio requires and the recipe requires a little bit of additional fat but not too much so we have the additional yolks uh, the whole eggs to help hold the, uh, the whole dough recipe together uh, we add them slowly one or two at a time allow them to incorporate at this point, you can switch over to the pulse on the food processor. Everything sinks to the bottom, so you pulse it and it jumps right back up to the top. Keeps everything properly incorporated uh, and saves time. Keep your recipe scaled out, and again, you always want to look at it and observe it the way it's coming together. Eggs are all different sizes. Someday they're going to be a little bit larger. It's going to throw your recipe off a little bit. Knowing what the end result of the dough should look like is something that you'll always need to know. Don't just prepare a recipe to prepare it. Know that it's being prepared properly. The end result is we're looking for something that's a little sandy, slightly grainy, because we still have to knead it together. All the things that they tell you not to do. Okay. And what you will see from here uh, can I have a little bench flat up please okay and we just lay it out just like this uh, you can tell right away it's a little moist but you can see that there's still a little bit of part of it that needs to be uh, kneaded together as it normally would be in any stage from here We just knead it together. See how it just comes together perfectly. <laughs> Saves a lot of time. Okay. 
It's a little bit sticky. I can feel that. So you just want to add a little bit of bench flour. And as you're pushing the pasta through the machine and as you're actually working the dough, you incorporate more flour to it to help dry it out a little bit. Uh, it's really just, again, it's a very simple process, but knowing the product is where you really excel faster than anybody else will. Now, as you can see, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just a different, heads up. <laughs> right? But you wouldn't know that in the amount of time that it just took to do what we just did, that you would end up with a pasta dough. You know, so it's not always about coming back. Right? It's just not always about spending all the time in the world and, and kneading it together and, and, and just putting it together and putting it off to the side. Feel it, touch it, know that it's proper, know that it feels right. Okay, from here, we would wrap it up, we'd put it in the refrigerator and just let it rest for about an hour, knowing that when we got ready to use it, uh, that we would have to let it come up to room temperature, uh, let it warm up a little bit. Don't want to just start working with it from ice cold. Uh, a lot of moisture in there. Uh, it's, it's very, very tough, very firm, um, and in turn could damage the machine. Okay? So I have one that we've already rested, and then the one that we're going to work with from this point forward for this dish. Um, thanks, Stanley. Nice. Now, uh, as I had mentioned yesterday, uh, I am a business owner. I spend money on certain things that I like to see last for a very, very long time, if not forever. Um, these pasta machines, this is the best pasta machine that you're ever going to get. Uh, they are imported from Italy. Uh, the parts have come from Italy. Uh, I have never found a source for this in the United States at all. These machines are about a thousand bucks a piece, for those of you that didn't know. All of the mechanism and all the gears that are in here are plastic. So if you put a tough piece of dough in there and start cranking the handle, chances are you're going to strip all the gears inside. The positive thing is that it takes probably 10 to 14 days to get the parts from Italy. So while your machine is down, <laughs> because you didn't know enough about it and understand it, uh, you're waiting for your parts to come from Italy, then once you get them, you have to figure out how to put them in there. Um, trust me on this one. I've been there. Um, the internet makes it a little bit easier, um, but also, be familiar with these things. Have respect for your tools and, and, and the tricks of the trade and the things that you will need. Uh, once you have to start replacing these things, you just end up spending money that you didn't need to spend. Okay? So our dough is warmed up. And Carrie's going to give me a hand here because uh, unfortunately the table's not as stable as we like it to be. Why don't you stand over here? Uh, and from here, we have the machine turned all the way back to the highest setting. Uh, at this point, we want to make sure we're just working the dough through the machine. Uh, we want to smooth it out, we want to stretch it, uh, and then eventually we want to cut it. But we only want to do that when it gets to the point where it feels proper. Um, it may look one way, but as long as it feels properly, whole nother story. So we'll start on the highest setting. Sorry. How many people does it take to run the pasta machine? <laughs> Sounds like a culinary joke. Three guys are working a pasta machine. Okay, uh, folding it over all the time. Okay, uh, you can see if you observe the way this is kind of rough right now and the way it looks right now, the end result is something that's going to be very smooth once we get to the point where we start stretching the dough out right before we cut it. Um, eventually, we will cut this into a fettuccine. Uh, if it needs flour along the way, um, we just feed more flour into it. If the dough feels like it's getting moist, that's when we add more flour and just basically knead it right into the dough. Okay, but you can see how quickly it's getting smooth. Still got a little ways to go, but it's getting there very fast. Okay, at this point, I like the way that looks. I'm gonna add some more flour uh, just to dry it a little bit further. Okay, on the highest setting, just to get the flour incorporated into it. Because as you stretch the dough, it becomes a little bit more moist because you're exposing the parts underneath once it gets thinner. Okay, so you just always have to have the right feel for the dough, knowing that you're looking for a certain dryness on the dough before you start to stretch it out. So at this point, I'm going to take it out a little bit further, slowly turning the machine down either a uh, half a setting or a full setting a time. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, again, if you put too much stress on the machine, it will break. It will cost you money. You'll have to wait for your parts to come from Italy, and then you'll have to figure out how to put them in the machine all by yourself. 
Okay, so we're turning it down just a little bit each time. And you can see that it's starting to get very smooth. Okay, and it also feels quite dry, but I'm gonna feed a little bit of flour into it at this point. I'm gonna run it through the machine one more time. Just to really push that flour into it, I'm gonna fold it over, but I'm also gonna turn it back to the highest setting again. Because it's almost at the texture that I'm looking for. And there was an air bubble in there too, so we got that one out now. Okay. Uh, anybody got any pasta questions at this point or anything that doesn't seem like it makes sense or it's a random question of any kind? Yes. Uh, do I discourage making the dough in a, uh, like a KitchenAid mixer or a, a mixer? Um, I don't discourage it, but I certainly think that um, all the ingredients incorporate much better uh, in a food processor and a lot faster. Um, you know, a mixer is it's, it's designed for certain things, and although a food processor, I don't think you'll find anywhere on the description or on the label where it says that it's uh, designed to make pasta dough in it. Uh, for some reason, I just don't feel that the ingredients get incorporated properly uh, when you're using something like a, a mixer on a, with a dough hook for a dough like this. Anybody else? Yes? Um, we do it on occasion. It's not something that we're committed to every day. Um, I'd be in a perfect world. I'd love to. Um, it's not necessarily our model uh, or really what our brand is all about, but we do it when we can. Um, you know, we encourage uh, staff to, you know, take some lobster, shuck some lobster meat, make some raviolis, run it for a special, uh, scallops, fish scraps, you know, whatever it may be. Encourage it. It keeps the creative flowing with everybody in the building. All right. Okay, so just keep running through. And I'm going to do myself a favor at this point before uh, Chef Stanley ends up taking the dough and walking to the other side of the room because it's going to start getting really long. We're going to cut it down a little bit. <laughs> and I, I got to make another comment because I thought this thing was pretty cool yesterday. Like, I don't know if you guys noticed this, or at least you guys won't. They went to school here. Not only is there a ruler on this side of the knife, it also has the sizes and the dimensions of all the cuts. Fascinating. <laughs> I just found it funny. And I had a little joke with somebody yesterday, and he thought it was serious, but a whole nother story. All right, so I just cut this piece down just to make it easier to manage. Um, I recommend doing that as well, uh, just so you, again, once you can see how this piece over here is already getting longer just from getting stretched out, literally, we can end up on the other side of the room with this because it's going to get that thin. Okay, keep turning it down. Okay, and now you can see it's just a really smooth uh, dough, or hopefully you can see, uh, really smooth. Uh, nice and dry, uh, nice elasticity, elasticity uh, in the dough. Uh, so this is exactly where I want it to be. Uh, now it's just cutting it to the proper uh, thickness uh, so it doesn't overcook, undercook, um, fall apart, so on and so forth. Oh, we've got to be careful here that it's feeding through the machine properly so it doesn't get too wrinkled. Okay, from here, we're going to put the cutter on. Okay, we'll switch the handles. And then, if you can help me out with that one second, Carrie. Notice how we're grabbing it and draping it around our arms, so you don't want to pinch it or, or try to uh, grab it too much or else you could end up tearing it. Look at that. How cool is that? There you go. First pasta. Yeah. It's pretty cool, huh? It's just one of those things that's just, the end result justifies all the hard work. Okay. Just gonna dust it with a little bit of flour. I'm gonna let it rest right here for one minute. Okay, and here we go. Uh, very simple. Very simple finish for everything, as per normal. Okay, I have a little bit of a butternut squash puree that we made yesterday. Uh, it will be heated up and come to the consistency of more of a, not necessarily a puree, but uh, kind of like a bisque, somewhere in between the two. A uh, little bit of untraditional in the saucing and the preparation, which uh, I find kind of unique. 
Um, again, pasta's pasta. Everybody's familiar with it, everybody's had it, but what can you do to make it slightly different uh, that sets yours aside from everybody else's? And here's what we've come up with. So we're gonna let that heat up on the side. A separate pan. Um, again, being a little bit different with the preparation uh, of sauteing, we'll heat up the pan with the olive oil. I'm not gonna get it smoking hot because I wanna add the ingredients, slowly steep them, uh, and sweat them to a point where we get the maximum flavor out of them. Stir in my puree. Uh, and again, this is something that's very simple. Um, we did a nice dice of the butternut squash. We took all the trimmings and all the ends, we seasoned them, we roasted it, we pureed it, and that's how we ended up with this. You can see it's just barely on the point of a, of a soup, uh, but just a little bit looser than a normal puree. So that's getting warm. This is heating up. Our pasta will go in the water literally 30 seconds to a minute before we need it. We won't need it any sooner. Uh, we don't want to overcook it. We want it to be as perfect as possible, taking all the chances out of overcooking. Okay, a little bit of garlic. A little bit of shallot. Okay, come up slowly. A little bit of seasoning. Again, still building those layers of flavor and developing them along the way. Once this gets to the point where we want it, then we're gonna add our sage. We just wanna put it in at the very last minute. I'm gonna take some pasta. I have my water seasoned with salt, pepper, and olive oil. Don't just throw it in there. Give it a quick mix around so you know it's not gonna stick together. I take this out, the olive oil is all on the top. As soon as I pull the pasta out, it gets a fresh coating of olive oil all along the outside of it. And again, not doing anything so uniquely different that nobody can comprehend. I have some butternut squash that was diced. We did it uh, this morning. We heated it up. A uh, little bit of olive oil, uh, some seasoning, a little bit of nutmeg, uh, and just a quick brumoisette at the end. Ready to go as you would have this mise en place on your working station in a restaurant. Stirring your pasta, making sure your puree is heating up properly. Check it for seasoning. A little bit of additional salt, pepper. Okay, butternut squash right here. Okay, uniquely add a little bit of sage leaves. And again, you can chef it on them, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I like rustic food. I like to just tear fresh herbs right at the last minute of using them. Uh, it releases most of the flavor, most of the oils. Uh, but if you want to have a nice little nine pan of chef and uh, herbs on your station, go right ahead. I like to tear them with my hands and just get that really fresh, rustic aroma out of it. Okay, pasta, let's give it another stir. How does that look? Notice the color, how different it is now, based on the fact that uh, we just added a little bit of that saffron to it. Give it a quick taste. How is it, Stanley? Good. <laughs> Ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Oh, turn it off. Drain the pasta. Again, olive oil floats right to the top. Water and oil separate. Uh, this just got an amazing coating of olive oil as it came out. Okay, we add it to here. Change over to the tongs. Quick toss. Stir it all in. Okay, we just added the pasta so we know we need a reseason. Okay, and that's ready. Thank you, Stanley. Okay. Uh, you know it's not going to get stuck together because it has olive oil on the pasta as well as in the pan. That's going to be fine. Here's how we finish it. Take our plate, take our spoon, take our puree. Uh, in, normally you would toss the sauce with the pasta and coat it all evenly. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to take the puree, we're going to coat the bottom of the plate, and then take our pasta. Make sure we're getting plenty of that diced butternut squash in there. I'm gonna put it right on top. And again, we're not doing anything that is mind-blowing, earth-shattering. We're just finding a different way to present the food that we have in a different fashion. And really, that's what separates good from great, unique from the same. All depends on what you wanna be and where you're going in the marketplace. Okay, a little bit of this right on top. Okay, from here. Uh, almost done. Again, building the layers of flavor. Uh, I'm gonna put a little bit more sage on top. Just a little bit torn right on top. 
Okay, I'm gonna take my extra virgin olive oil and do a nice little finish. And then, pecorino parmesan, a little bit salty, uh, uh, not as uh, grainy, not as um, sweet as Parmesan Reggiano, a nice enhancement to things like fresh pasta. So we're just gonna take a microplane and a nice piece and just shave it right over the top. And that's it, butternut squash fettuccine, butternut squash puree with fresh sage and grated Pecorino Parmesan. <laughs> Easy stuff. Um, any questions about pasta? Anybody? Anything? Okay, great. Oh, we'll be fine. How are you? Ooh, damn. You must be one of those pastry people. Shit. <laughs> I was hoping this question wouldn't come out. Um, I, my, the, the question, in case anybody didn't hear it, is how do I feel about desserts and what's my dessert ability and capabilities? Um, as chefs, we all have one or two things that we keep in our arsenal that we feel is a good dessert. Um, when we have the chance to present that to somebody that is a dessert professional, they usually take a look at us and laugh, uh, which is fine. Um, for me, I always feel that dessert is uh, something that at the end of the meal is uh, you know, I believe in, in uh, nostalgic type desserts and I believe in things that take people back to a different place. Um, but again, that's, that's in the brand that I'm developing. Um, I have a very high respect for people that uh, can do the things that most of you can do. Um, but, you know, we have to please the masses. Um, I have a cheesecake recipe that doesn't require any cooking that is finished with gelatin. So uh, I, I do that very often, real often. <laughs> You know, it's a good, you can never do it in the same place more than once. Uh, so that one's staying where it is right now. Uh, and it's very simple. You take the, the graham cracker crumbs and mix them with the butter, serve it, put it in the bottom of a, a clear glass. Uh, we make the mousse, uh, which is goat cheese, uh, whipped cream, gelatin, uh, some sugar, some lemon zest. We pipe it into the cup. It sets up over, uh, over the course of a few hours. Uh, you take some cherries and uh, mix it with some brandy and uh, some toasted pistachios at the end, and it's a nice dessert. Uh, I would never want to uh, compete it anywhere, but you know, I mean, we do what we can, so we're not forced into buying things, really. I make a mean brownie, too. <laughs> I just shove peanut butter in it. It's got to be good, right? So, uh, okay, uh, next item. This is, uh, again, going back to what we do at the restaurant, very simple stuff. Um, seafood, it's, it's the foundation of everything that we do. Uh, we're proud of it. We love it. It doesn't take much enhancement uh, as long as the product you are starting with is where are you going? Huh? Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, you too. Thank you. <laughs> um, seafood, it comes out of the ocean. The, the less you do to it, the better it is going to be no matter what, no matter when, no matter how. Um, knowing how to receive it in the beginning and what to look for in the beginning. <laughs> Uh, is really the difference between passing on something to your customers, to your guests, that is fresh and of quality to the fact that it's something that isn't. So you really need to know, and I know they spent a lot of time in the curriculum here teaching you the difference between a bad piece of fish and a good piece of fish and what to look for. Take this advice. You are getting great advice. Um, you have to understand the process uh, in order to know a little bit more about it. When you get the opportunity after you are all unleashed into the industry, Find a couple of seafood suppliers, go see their facilities, talk to the people, talk to the salesmen, look on the shelves, see how they're doing their thing. There's a lot of information available from these people, you just have to ask. <coughs> Where is uh, any, uh, anybody out here from the West Coast at this point right now or no? Any West Coasters? Where are you from? Where? Paso Robles, okay. Uh, up north a little bit. Do you have a lot of, uh, or any restaurant experience prior to coming to school? Okay. There's a big company out in Santa Monica, and I'm sorry, out in California that uh, I work with regularly because they're great people and, and I just love what they do. Uh, Santa Monica Seafood, these guys have uh, all their HACCP on hand. I mean, they're really an amazing company and have an amazing facility that they love to show off. Find these people that are like them um, and 
get into what they're doing and have them show you what they're all about. Uh, they have some fascinating things to teach. Uh, they have some fascinating things to see, and you'll see their product line on first hand before anybody else. So get, get friendly with most of these people, if not all of them. All right, um, I got some bass here. Uh, striped bass, wild striped bass. You can see I have the skin on. Um, yesterday we were contemplating with this. The flesh is nice color. Uh, it looks nice and uh, uh, clean and clear. And clear. Uh, it's not spongy. It's not frozen. It's fresh fish. It's really great. Um, normally, uh, you have two options here. You can leave the skin on. Um, you can pan fry it, eat the skin. It gets crispy. It's really nice. Just make sure you're scraping the skin to get all the excess moisture out of it so it does get crispy. Um, you can grill it, which we are about to do. Um, but we are going to grill it with the skin on. Um, and then probably peel the skin off after the fact. Reason being is there is a layer of fat that is in between the skin and the flesh of the meat that holds a tremendous amount of flavor. Um, if you cook it with it on, you keep that flavor inside the piece of fish. Uh, every piece of fish has this capability, um, so don't ever think that when you get a whole fish or a side of salmon or a side of bass to just take the skin off and disregard it. You don't have to serve it with the skin on, but you can certainly cook it with the skin on and get that flavor advantage that the person standing next to you would not be able to get. Okay, All the little things you need to know. Um, to that, we very simply, this just looks like olive oil. This is extra virgin olive oil, fresh lemon juice, and fresh lemon zest. You have to season the fish anyway. You might as well season it with something that enhances it. Fish and lemon uh, are just two things that are always going to go together. Uh, so you might as well incorporate them somehow, as well as a nice little olive oil, uh, which always adds a nice, tremendous amount of flavor. Uh, to this, we're just going to normally season with salt and pepper on both sides, because you eat both sides. You might as well season both sides. Uh, and you can pan fry this. We contemplated doing that yesterday, but we're going to take a stab at the grill here and see, see how it goes. Uh, salt and pepper on both sides. And again, I have my lemon oil. Not too much, not too little, just a little dusting on top of the fish gives it flavor, not only, but it also gives it something to help prevent it from sticking on the grill. Very simple. Uh, and as I had mentioned earlier, this is something that we uh, do on a regular basis. And when it comes off the grill, the pores of the protein are wide open. Get in another brush of the lemon oil. The lemon oil absorbs into the fish, adds moisture, adds flavor. And you haven't really done anything mind-blowing in order to get there. We're going to guess. That feels a little hot. And I'm going to try a couple of different things here. I'm going to put one skin side up, <coughs> excuse me, one skin side down. I got to see what the best result is going to be, because at this point, I'm not sure. So I might as well try two different things. A very simple finish to go with. Uh, yes, you're reading the packet. You're reading the information. It's pico de gallo. It's salsa. It's whatever you want to call it. Um, at different times of the year, um, you have the advantage of heirloom tomatoes, uh, you have the advantage of vine ripe tomatoes, hothouse tomatoes. If you live close to a farmer's market, you have the advantage to go to the farmer's market and buy what the farmers like to call salsa tomatoes. They're very cheap, they're extremely ripe and ready to go, and if they don't go on that day, they will not be good anymore. Um, so you can usually get these things at a, a fraction of the cost uh, from these people. Again, you just have to source out your, your uh, proper uh, places where you get your food from. Produce suppliers will carry number twos on a lot of produce. You will never know the difference between a number two to, uh, potato and a number one potato. There is no difference. It's just the size. You need to save a little bit of money. Use these resources. They have everything there. It's on their product list. You're just making them work for you because the end result is, is that's their job. Push them. Find out what they can do for you. Bring them into your mix a little bit further. Get the product from them that you need. That's their job. Okay? Very simple. Uh, I have some diced tomatoes. In this case, we're using Roman tomatoes. Okay, I have some diced red onion. And these are all diced according to the size on the side of the chef's knife. So they are correct. Okay, uh, I have some jalapeno. You can make it as spicy as you want. You can make it as sweet as you want. You can use a red Fresno chili, which isn't as spicy. Do whatever you want. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Make it what you want it to be. Uh, we have some chopped cilantro. Coriander in some places, cilantro according to me. Hey, we have uh, olive tapenade. Again, building the layers of flavor, something a little bit different. Uh, the reason why we do the things that we do at my restaurant is to, in order to keep the prices down so people are happy. If we give you a fresh piece of fish with a very simple garnish that goes with it, and we only can charge you $18 when the guy across the street from me is charging $24 for the same thing, I've done my job. I've made my cost, I've pleased people, and I've increased my um, ability to be busier on a regular basis than the guy across the street from me. Um, again, it's not just about cooking. There is marketing. There is 
uh, uh, advertising, there are promotions, there's a whole bunch of things that you will need to be comfortable with and familiar with in your career as you move along. A little bit of the olive top and knot. Okay, I have a line. Soften it up on the inside a little bit. Make sure that there's not a proper way to cut a lime according to the knife. There isn't. Okay, fresh squeezed juice. Uh, if you're in a massive production situation, I understand that people have to buy convenience products. Uh, just find the best convenient products you can find. If you have to use fresh lime juice or squeezed lime juice, there are plenty of resources for a fresh squeezed uh, key limes, whatever it may be. Find the product, make it as best as you can. If you have to have lime juice that you need for 500 people, I don't expect somebody to buy 25 cases of limes and start juicing them a week out. Find the product, taste it, get what you need from your suppliers. Okay. Okay, the skin will not uh, on the grill come out as crispy or as clear as it will in a saute pan, but again, we're just trying to keep it on there at this point to get that additional flavor uh, that happens to be trapped in between the skin and the flesh of the meat. It's the whole idea. Not to mention, that one's not ready. So we're going to let that sit for a couple more minutes, uh, and then we'll get back to it. But in the meantime, uh, we take our pico de gallo, our salsa, whatever it is that you would like to call it. We have all of our ingredients in there. We're going to add a little bit of salt and pepper. And then at this point, the most important thing to do is to taste it. Because we have to taste everything to make sure it's seasoned properly, it tastes good. Um, and that's nice, you know, right away. Next time you get in the habit of tasting something, close your eyes. And really let your imagination, let your mind identify what's in your eating. Um, you will pick up different flavors and things that you have never recognized before. Um, we look at things and we automatically know, I got tomatoes, I got onions, I got this, I got that. Close your eyes the next time and taste it and really think about what you're eating uh, and what the flavors are that you're picking up. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit more salt and pepper. Um, I really like the olive tapenade component, so I'm going to add just a little bit more to that. Okay, and this is ready. So keep this close by, and uh, now we're just waiting for our grill to catch up. We're all miles ahead of you. Okay, uh, at this point, it's already hot, the pores are open. I would take a minute and just brush that one more time uh, to get that really refreshing olive oil, lemon juice. Uh, it's all in there. Take advantage of the flavors. Flip this one over, see what the other side looks like. There we go. I think we finally found the hot spot. Uh, any questions about grilling fish? Any uh, preparation? Any Anything going on in anybody's mind that you want to uh, discuss or any questions? No questions. Wow, oh, this is the first group I've ever seen that knows everything. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yes? The hardest fish to cook, um, they all depend on the application that you're trying to put with them. Um, I think um, some of the most difficult ones uh, would be definitely a Dover sole. Uh, it's on the bone. It's, it's a difficult fish. Uh, it's, there's a very, very small threshold uh, of being cooked properly and being overcooked. Um, very, very difficult. Uh, but once you do it a few times and you're familiar with it, then obviously it's, it's not as difficult. Um, I would say in general that thin fish is very difficult to cook more than something thick uh, because you're, you're, you're opening yourself up to error a lot more than you would with something else. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, because this, well, the question is, how come the skin doesn't get as crispy on the grill as it does in the pan? Um, the, the cooking application is just different. Um, when you're in a saute pan with hot oil, uh, you have the entire surface of the skin on the oil. So therefore, it browns evenly all the way through. Uh, when you're on the grill, I, you're subject to the spaces on the grill. So therefore, it doesn't mark it properly on all the other places. Uh, so therefore, it doesn't get as crispy. I'm going to leave one on, and we're going to take one off, um, just so we can keep moving, because we do have another dish to, to do. Uh, so at this point, 
I'm going to do one more brush of the lemon oil on this piece. I'm going to take the skin off just like that. I'm going to take a little bit of my pico de gallo, my salsa, whatever we're calling it at this point. I'm going to put some on the bottom just like this. Okay, we're going to take our spatula. Um, we are going to flip this over because we do want to show the presentation side over the skin side because it just looks a little bit more attractive. If the skin was on, we would do it differently. Okay, we're going to put a little bit more of the pico de gallo on top. Like this. Uh, again, I like the olive. Just a little bit more, just like that. Um, as you've seen before, it's a nice finish with the extra virgin olive oil. And in this case, I have some really nice sea salt. Just a little bit on the fish. Again, it's hot, the pores are open. Season it now so the flavor's in there. Uh, and that is a very simple grilled wild striped bass uh, with a olive, green olive tapenade, extra virgin olive oil, and sea salt. Okay. And this one, as you can see, the, it does get nice and crispy, but it's not even just because of the grilling part of it. Uh, but again, at this point, I would take that off, season it, and we'll put this one off to the side. I'm sure I'll find a friend to share that one with at some point. Okay. Uh, we have any other questions about fish, uh, grilling fish, anything at this stage? Uh, that anybody is curious of. Oh, thank you. When you order your fish, um, how do you get it butted? Like, do you break down in house or do you get like already like, um, It depends on the fish and it depends on the application, honestly. Um, sometimes, uh, if you're doing your own grab locks or you're curing your own fish or doing something like that, you want to start from the most natural, raw form to ensure that it's as fresh as it can be. Um, you know, again, we live, in a, we live in a business that time is very valuable. Um, and if you have a great source for seafood uh, and you know that your fishmonger or your fish supplier is very reputable, um, there's nothing wrong with getting sides of fish and not breaking down the whole fish yourself. Um, you have to think about time. You have to think about utilization of all the waste. You know, do you make fish stock? Do you have a use for it? Uh, you know, where do you go with all the other things that you're going to end up on for breaking down your own fish? It just depends on the application and, and what you're using it for. Um, I think it's great for people to stay in practice. But if it's not practical and it costs you money at the end of the day, then you're probably not doing yourself any favors. Yes? I'll take that one, thanks. When the fish gets ordered in, they sear it later, like when it's fired. Can you finish it on the oven? Is there a way to do that? Um, you can. The question is, is, is um, how much time, I believe your question is, how much time do you have from the point of a piece of fish being seared uh, to where it gets finished and gets served, and is there an opportunity to put it in the oven or something like that? Um, there is, but I think you should look at the system a little bit um, kind of backwards from there and say that how much time does it take to cook that piece of fish so when it is fired, I know I can produce it in five to six minutes, so there is no wait time and there is no carryover time, uh, which leads to drying out. Uh, I would think the other way around backwards and, and say how can I do it without having to sear it and then put it in the oven. Good question, though. Anybody else? Yes? Say again? When you took the skin off the fish, why didn't you grow that side? Because uh, at that point, that's where we're trying to keep all that additional moisture and that additional fat. So if I flipped it over, it would, just, it would, it would cook right off or it would drip right off and it wouldn't even be there. Anybody else? OK. Last item. I need some hot water for this one. Um, I am a massive fan of oysters. I like certain things that are very simple. Um, oysters are one of those items. I like a stove that cooperates too, though. Okay, I'm um, just going to put this aside for now. Let me get this warmed up a little bit. I didn't realize how cold it was over there. Um, we are going to make uh, a very simple baked oyster. Um, the difference is uh, normally. You would take your oyster, you would shuck it, you would put your ingredients in, your stuffing, whatever it is, you would bake it, 
uh, you would take it out and finish it with whatever you want to finish it with. Um, we use these amazing little oysters. Uh, they're called kushi oysters. They're cultivated from Japan. Uh, they're very small. They're like gumdrops. Um, those of you who are familiar with Nantucket Bay scallops, same feeling when you eat one of these. The difference is, and, and what's pretty amazing, um, is that they are cultivated, but what happens is if you look at the shells, um, they're wider, I'm sorry, they're thicker than they are wider. Um, these get harvested partially in a, um, uh, I guess you can say like a whirlpool where the water is turned this way, it's tumbled. So in the event when that happens, the oysters are spinning this way, somehow, some way, it makes the shell grow the opposite direction as we're used to seeing. Uh, the end result is that what's inside may be the size of a dime, uh, but it's a good half inch thick and it's just this really sweet succulent uh, oyster that's on the inside. If you've never had them, um, you will get a chance to try these and it will blow you away. Uh, they're that good. Uh, so again, it's a baked oyster um, to the point or a certain degree. Um, we have a cream spinach, very simple, uh, with a, a, maybe it started with a basic bechamel sauce with some spinach. Um, we have a hollandaise, which is one of the Okay, mixed with tomato, which makes it a, what does it make it? Does anybody know? All right, what if I told you I had 500 bucks to give the person that got the answer right? <laughs> I'm not paying you. Oh, no way. Um, it, end result is uh, uh, tomato product mixed with the hollandaise is a Chiron sauce. It's one of the derivatives of one of the mother sauces. Um, again, very important that you know these things. If you put orange in it, you get a Maltese. You know, these are some of the things that I still remember and some of the things that will always stay with me. Get to know these things. They are very important. Um, at our restaurant, we do uh, this dish. It's very popular. People really like it. It tastes so freaking good. Um, that it's really hard not to. Um, we make a homemade ketchup. Uh, the base of it is uh, some pre-made ketchup, but we roast the tomatoes with smoked paprika, uh, onions, and the end result is we mix uh, together with some vinegar. We puree it smooth. It's uh, one of the things that gives us the cutting edge on having one of the best hamburgers in town, um, as well as enables us to uh, use it in other things along the way as to this baked oyster. So uh, on the oyster itself, many people are misunderstood about opening oysters. Um, very simple, the more you handle them and the more you are rough and rugged with them, the harder they're gonna be to open. You have to look at an oyster as, as a living, breathing um, item. It's, 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 a, it's alive right now um, until I do what I'm gonna do. Uh, but at this point, the more that you manhandle it, it's kind of a defense mechanism, so it's harder to open. So if you are very gentle with them uh, and take very ease in opening them, the end result is that you can open them up very, very easily. And I'm sure that most of you just saw that that didn't take any pressure at all on my part. Um, again, a little trick that we do in the business, when we flip, uh, once we open the oyster, they look a little rough on the top, we we'll flip them over. And then you just have a nice, beautiful uh, oyster with all the brine in there. We'll set it up on a towel so it doesn't lose too much of the moisture. Uh, and it's really that simple. The more that you are delicate with them, the easier it is they are to open. Just like that. And I'll do four, because I have a dish that holds four. Okay, very simple. And one more. Okay, so my oysters are open. I'm gonna come over to the stove here. My butter is warm. Uh, I have some cream spinach. I'm just going to heat it up lightly in this big pot. Uh, and we're just going to build the oyster itself. Um, very, very simple. We don't need much because, as you can see, the oysters are very, very small. Okay, just going to warm this up. In the meantime, Carrie's going to start with making the hollandaise because, as a culinary student, you should know how to do that, yeah? supposedly. Um, and as we're completing this, there's going to be a sampling coming around for everybody to try uh, while we're making this one. Just let's lightly whisk just to cook the egg. Okay, you familiar with it? Okay, good. Okay, uh, everybody will have a chance to try this dish as it comes around uh, and we'll finish it up here. Okay. Um, again, we don't cook the oyster. We simply just put the warm cream spinach on top. It cooks it through just enough. Uh, we finish it with the tomato hollandaise. Uh, we 
a little bit of um, a gratiné on top. In this case, we're using a blowtorch and then a little bit of ground bacon. So, uh, Anybody familiar? Any uh, questions about anything that's going on as far as baked oyster and the varieties of oysters? Uh, they're all different. They come from many, many different places. They all taste different. Uh, so I recommend that you try them no matter where you are because they're all different. Okay? Just a warm on the spinach. And I'm just putting a little bit on top of each one. Just enough. Because again, you don't want to overpower the oyster, you want to enhance it. Okay. How you doing? I'm gonna jump in? Yes. Okay. Okay, just lightly whisking the egg. We just wanna cook it, 140 degrees, yeah? Uh, just to make sure that it kills any bacteria, uh, as well as we need it to be cooked in order to emulsify the butter into it. Has everybody gotten to this part of the curriculum already and broken the hollandaise and knows how to put it back together and all the mistakes that come along with it. Unfortunately, it's a tough one. If some of you go out there and end up doing mass quantities of breakfast, I feel bad for you. You're gonna have to get up an extra 45 minutes earlier in the morning in order to get this part of your job done. Okay, uh, wanna grab a ladle, please? Has everybody tried the oyster already? What is the, the consensus? I see them going around. Has anybody had it yet? Okay, uh, let's do two ounces of butter, please. Easy. Good, 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 good. Okay, uh, so we have our, we just emulsified the butter into there. Uh, let's add a little bit of the ketchup, one teaspoon of ketchup, please. Okay, and this is where it goes from one stage right to the next. We just add the tomato in, and the homemade ketchup is just something that we do. Feel free to use tomato paste, ketchup. Oh, let me get one little scoop. Okay. And as per normal, I just want to make sure I give it a quick taste. It needs a little bit of seasoning. Uh, and at this point, tomato is considered an acid, so we don't want to overwhelm it with uh, any other kind of acid or tomato juice, or I'm sorry, lemon juice. Yep, get the torch started up, please. Okay, so we have our hollandaise. It's a little bit right on top. And if you have a broiler, obviously the broiler is the better choice. Um, if you don't, then we are subject to do what we're doing. Uh, we have some rock salt uh, in it, some herbs. Uh, cracked peppers, uh, bay leaves, uh, a few dried seasoning, just something to make it a little bit more exciting. Okay, I am gonna gratiné these right on here because as I torch the hollandaise, uh, it will also add some heat to the salt as well as the aromatics that are on top of it. So it'll help release a little bit more um, aroma so when it gets put down in front of somebody, it has a great aroma coming out of it. And we live in a world and in a business that we get to use cool things like blow torches. Okay, just a real quick brown on the top. Very simple. Okay, and then we finish with some ground bacon. Um, we don't bake it right on top, but we do add it as one of the components. So you have a baked uh, cushy oyster, cream spinach, uh, Sharon, and smoked bacon. So I hope uh, everybody had a chance to just see something a little bit exciting, a little bit different, and, but understand that you do not need to enter the world after your education and think that you're going to be the next uh, chef that is doing the most popular, the most unique type of cuisine. What I think is more important and what has always been important to me uh, is to cook the food that you really enjoy, but cook it properly and take the time to be the professional that you are paying to be right now. Take this education and build on it, but the fundamentals that you are learning will stay with you for your entire career. 
try to do the best you can every day and just cook the greatest food that you can and you will be all right. Okay? Thank you for coming, everybody. It's really been great being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great, Thank you. great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, uh, in the early stages, it, it might have been considered illegal. Um, but, you know, what I find is that, and what I highly, highly recommend, is that it, you have other hobbies, you have other interests. Um, a lot of the things that come to my mind that I want to do, that I know I can do, uh, come to me when I'm either going for a run or riding my bike around or uh, just kind of daydreaming or you know just reading magazines and books is a big part of it too. Um, but again, we live in the food business and everything you do, you, le you, uh, you, know, you breathe, you sleep, you, you live the food business. And walking through the grocery store should provide some sort of in uh, inspiration. You know, everywhere you go and everything you do, uh, dine out as often as you can. And that doesn't mean going to all the high-end restaurants in, in, in every major city. You know, go to the noodle shop, go to a cheap sushi bar, go to a good deli. These places are all around you, and there could be some inspiration anywhere you go. You know, but what I find is um, uh, a detriment is that when you spend so much time thinking about it that you almost block yourself. So take some time to do some things that are recreational as well as fun, uh, and inspiration will always come from somewhere. You're welcome. Anybody else? Um, it's, well, the question is, what do I do at this point to, to continue to learn? And that's a really good question because uh, I, I do all of the following. And uh, at this stage in my life, I, I'm not too proud to do anything. Uh, and I, I really, uh, I'm not ashamed of anything. And if it, you know, I have a lot of great friends in the business. And if it requires, you know, going into somebody else's establishment and still putting my position, myself in a position to stage or, or just to be somewhere and observe, uh, a lot of it comes with industry friends. A lot of it comes from reading. Um, a lot of it comes from online, too, because you now have that resource that your outreach is everywhere now. And, uh, you know, I got a really good friend in my computer. His name is Google. And, you know, you can just go right to, and you just type in, you know, what's cool in France right now or what's cool in, in Austria. And, and information just comes up like crazy. Um, so, you know, I do spend a lot of time on that research and development part uh, because it is important because we always have to stay one step ahead of ourselves. But don't ever be too proud to get back in there and, no matter after you know how many years it's been, uh, you know, put the jacket back on, throw an apron on, and jump in there and see what you can do. You'd be amazed at yourself. I have a question. Yeah. Since I've been here, I see like a lot of ego between chefs. How do we deal with that? In <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you don't look like a fighter to me. <laughs> um, you know, we live in a business that, unfortunately, that's what it is, and. Uh, what I find is that the egos usually crash um, very quickly, um, and it's the people that, um, again, keep your, you know, as, as a young cook entering the industry and entering the world, keep your head down. Don't take this the wrong way. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Nobody really wants to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Every now and again, you will be able to offer something that's very important, but as young people, you need to learn uh, the process first and learn what's going on around you. Ask questions. Ask important questions. Uh, but for the most part, keep, you know, keep your head down, learn the process, learn what's going on around you. When you start a new job, you walk around the place, and if you go in the storeroom to get olive oil, go, don't go in the storeroom looking for the olive oil. Go in the storeroom looking all the way around you. Um, and get familiar with your surroundings so when you need something or somebody asks you for something, you know exactly where to go get it and where to find it. Um, so really just, I mean, the ego thing, it, it never lasts, and it won't last for very long. Um, because there's a, it's, a, it's tough out there, man. It's really tough out there. And the people that end up doing really well are not the people that are egotistical at all. Um, if anything, those are the ones that end up uh, to their own demise, and it takes them a while to figure out why. Yep. Head down, eyes open, mouth shut, learn. Learn how to cook. What are the chefs that influences you at the moment? Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. Jesus. Uh, the question is, is that, you know, uh, who do I consider a chef that inspires me the most? 
Uh, damn. I can't say that it's one particular person. I mean, eventually you find yourself around the people you're meant to be around, um, and you're surrounded by people that you're meant to be surrounded by, and, and I think that's where it, it really becomes exciting and energetic, and uh, you know, where you can talk about different things with different people that have different points of view. You know, so, uh, you know, it's not one. I mean, uh, I have a lot of great friends in the industry and a lot of great friends in the business that we talk about unique things, but I think we all inspire each other. Yes. If you were going to hire an intern or bring an intern on board, yes. what qualities would you feel that are really important to you that you would foresee that this young person is going to become successful? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a fascinating question for me. Um, and I think everybody heard it, but the question is, what do I look for uh, when I'm hiring cooks, chefs, uh, people that you know, work in our organization? Um, you know, the basic rules have never changed, and there are a lot of the rules that you are living underneath right now, and you may not know they're helping you in a certain way. Uh, obviously, presenting yourself in a proper manner. Um, you all come here with your uniforms properly cleaned, properly um, ironed, uh, your shoes are polished. It's all part of it. We look at these things, and I'm one of those guys, I look at people's shoes as soon as they walk in the door. It's just everybody has their one or two things through the interviewing process that they go to immediately. Um, you know, it's one of those fine details. I look right at the ground, and, and even with cooks, when I walk into certain places, I'll look at their shoes. It gives me an idea of, you know, how much do they pay attention to the fine details, uh, and that's one of them. They usually, some people forget that. Uh, but the rules haven't changed uh, for me and anybody else in, in the organization that we have. People that are properly presented, um, I will always, and this is no bullshit, any time that I get a resume in front of me and I see uh, a J&W graduate or somebody that's attending the program, I will contact you before I will contact anybody else. Uh, only because I know what you should be learning, uh, and those are the kind of qualities that I want in my kitchens and the things that I do. Um, be open. Be honest. If you don't know something, don't pretend to know it. We talk to you guys all day long about budgets and financials, and, and you just see the pale look on their face, and their eyes go, you know, roll back in their head. And like, if you do not know something, do not ever hesitate to ask. Your biggest detriment would be to pretend that you do know something and you don't. Uh, but present yourself uh, in a professional manner always, all the time. Be respectful. Be understanding. Do your homework prior to coming to an interview. Know something about the person, the company, the organization, the restaurant. Know anything about it. The address, the phone number. Uh, you know, the first question we always go is, what do you know about us? And if nobody knows anything about what we're doing, then you obviously haven't taken the time to be a, uh, to research it. You're looking for a job. You're not looking for a career. You're just looking for a place to be. Uh, and anybody can do that. But train yourself. These are the things that will become very important to you through your career. You will use these skills over and over and over again. Trust me, get good at them. If you go on an interview for a job you don't even want, practice interview. So now when you get in front of the one that you do want, you'll be very good, you'll be very calm, you'll be collective, and you'll be able to be a successful interviewee. It's all a lesson. Everything that you do is a lesson. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, I know most of you have to get back to class in about five minutes. So at this time, I'd like to thank you all for being here. But I'd like to thank the chef. This was uh, something we've been trying to do for a couple of years. And you know, as the chef said earlier, it's always nice. I think Adam said it. Uh, it's always nice to bring one of our own chefs back, somebody who actually was in the seat just like you are. Bring him back, because he really understands what you're going through right now. And, um, you know, I, I hope you got the message here, because the message was not about this here. The message was about you know how to be successful, how to have some passion, how to be in love with this food, and how uh, you know how you can be successful as young people coming out of here, and and how to take advantage of the resources you have here because you have some terrific resources. Sometimes you don't realize that when you're here, you do have some amazing people here, and it's just a matter of finding them who they are and asking the right questions. Chef has been terrific. Really Thank has you. been terrific. And I've got a couple of things here for you. <laughs> By the way, before we go, I just wanted to just. This gentleman over here, Stanley Nikas, you've seen him sitting here. Most of you probably have no idea who Stanley is. Uh, we started this program in 1978. Eight. 1978. <laughs> the Distinguished Visiting Chef program. This was Stanley's program back in 1978. Stanley, this is 162. Stanley has assisted 160 of the 162 Distinguished Visiting Chefs that have been here over the years. So he's been instrumental in making sure that this program works. Stanley is, you might have to tell him how old you are? 70, 87. 87 years old. 
Stanley still puts his uniform on. In actual fact, Stanley's got a function tonight, and he can't stay for lunch today. He's got to race home to open his restaurant. He still runs a restaurant, and he will be in his whites tonight cooking. At 87 years old, he still runs his own restaurant. So. people asking and saying that I want to open my own restaurant. That was always my goal. When I come out of the Navy after the war in 1945-46, I bought my first restaurant in 1946, January. And I've been there ever since. Pretty amazing. Yeah, congratulations. At this time, I've got a, uh, a Stingham's Vision Chef medal that I'd like to present to Chef Liefrey. Chef, <laughs> join the club. Yeah, the thank you. The 160 <laughs> seconds of the Stingham's Vision Chef. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I won my first gold medal. There you go. <laughs> I also, I also thank you, sir. Thank you very much. On behalf of the uh, University College of Culinary Arts, and I don't have my glasses, so I'll do the best I can. For the kitchen, I've Scott Liefrey. 93, nice. Distinguished Visiting Chef, December 2010. We have a nice personalized knife kit that we will present to the chef and hopefully he will get some use of it. Most chefs have a lot of knives, but these are um, nice knives. Thank you so much. Again, thank, thank you. you very much. Nice.